Welcome out to your currencies, FX, and crypto midweek. It's nice to be with you. May 17th, Corey here as per usual for these midweeks. And let's jump into it. Let's talk about what's happening in the markets and where, uh, as the great Wayne Gretzky said, we want to skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's at right now. So we're going to try to determine next moves and, and get an idea of where to look. So in the equity side, I've been outright bullish. We've talked about that, that ultimately over the past few weeks as this banking crisis and all those things kind of came to an end. And I was calling for the end of that sort of banking crisis sooner than others, certainly. If there were not continued runs on banks and the Fed stepped in quickly, um, this banking crisis of sorts was kind of finished before it almost even got started in a way. So um, it was not a crisis where they were hemorrhaging and losing a ton of money based on assets that were deteriorating massively in value. They own treasuries. And because they own treasuries, and that's what was causing the problem, well, it's mark-to-market -market accounting. It's that they had a loss on them if they were forced to sell. But if they weren't forced to sell, then they were going to make their income and they were going to get paid back. Uh, the principal at maturity. So do they have some assets that are under, you know, the cost basis if they have to sell early on? Yes, but that's not a major problem where it's like, oh, we've got a banking crisis and all these banks are collapsing. That's not it at all. We're in this cup and handle pattern in the equity markets, and I think we're starting to see that upside break starting to materialize when that happens, my point of emphasis is watch for the big exhaustion. What does it look like? Well, here's your big cup and handle. The markets have been trending higher. Let's imagine we break out. We run higher for a couple of weeks or what have you. And then some big exhaustive phase up in here. Some big uh, good news type of scenario. And I talked about this either last week or the week before. I it would make sense to me, I don't know if this is how it will go, but it would make perfect sense that the peak in equities will be right around the time the CPI numbers are starting to come down dramatically. And that's going to happen over the next two months. I think that very first one where you see CPI drop by 1%, I could see equities really ramping up into that. And then that big CPI drop because remember we're losing an, a monthly number that's over 1% and if we add a number that's 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or whatever, you're going to see a 1% drop in the annualized inflation number and that could be really correlated, maybe not to the perfect day, to the penny, but pretty darn close to that exhaustion high. I could see the markets going skyward. As everybody says, the inflation problem is behind us and the Fed's on hold forever and they're going to start cutting rates. And all of a sudden, all this hope starts to come into the markets and this big rally up here, this big exhaustive pattern, I think that's where we could see the highs. And if it were really to time up that way, that would be picturesque. But watch for that exhaustion high. Am I bullish? Absolutely in the short term. But I understand that we're probably going to form an exhaustion high and then start to uh, deteriorate from there. So the safety trade I don't like. I've been anti-safety trade for the past couple of weeks, meaning short crypto, short gold, and unfortunately I thought short U.S. dollar. Now I, I got two out of three right. Gold and crypto have certainly gone lower and pretty nicely so. U.S. dollar, though, and here's what I think I got wrong. All three of these rallied sharply on the kind of banking crisis that came and went, right? They're a great place to go, especially gold and crypto, obviously, if you're anti-whatever U.S. If you think that there's going to be more money printing, this and that, you kind of hide out here. If you think the banks are in trouble, you hide out here. It made sense that those got a pop. And the sentiment around them was very, 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 very bullish. But 
I felt like a couple of weeks ago, we kind of saw exhaustion highs in both of those markets. Now, I thought U.S. dollar would go down as well because it made sense to me that the dollar popped on the anti-bank, but I think the dollar's just moving on its own. And maybe the dollar is more related to the debt ceiling and what's happening there, much more than anything to do with uh, what's happening in gold and, and crypto. So I did get that aspect of it wrong. If you said to me, where do I think that the dollar would have been over the past couple of weeks? Certainly, I would have thought, well, probably some risk on in equities. Uh, U.S. dollar should fall off. Japanese yen should fall off. Swiss franc should fall off. Uh, the yen and some of those are coming down. It, it all worked except for USD. USD has too many other things, and specifically the debt ceiling, which seems to be the next big event that everyone is paying attention to. So uh, Fed is still laser focused on inflation, but we know that especially over the next two weeks, inflation is going to get hit hard. Now let's look at the numbers for this week. Empire State Manufacturing, you don't see this type of dynamic very often. Expected to come in at minus 3.7, came in at minus 31.8. That is a uh, a big miss and obviously a recession type of number. CPI in Canada higher, hotter than expected at 0 0.7 versus the 0 0.5. Will Canada have to raise rates? Are they a little bit behind on that? Certainly the CAD caught a little bit of a pop on that, thinking that they might have to raise rates and be more aggressive to slow down inflation. That you know, could be looked at as a positive as they raise rates and, and such. USD retail sales, um, 0.4 but versus the 0.8 expected. 0.4, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but obviously a big miss. Came in at half of the number that they were expecting. So you're starting to see in the economy, we're certainly starting to see some economic numbers come in with a big slowdown and certainly, you know, not that we're in a recession, not that we're guaranteed to go into a recession, but certainly slowing. Let's at least put it that way. So as we look at this week's performance, you'll notice oil nice and strong and really the best performer. Crypto also pretty good at point plus four percent. Gold down equities up a little bit. Most of the equity gains have happened today, in fact. Now, if we look at the S&P chart, a couple of key points here as I see them. Here's your big resistance zone. This is the big cup and handle we've talked about, right? So you've been in this formation. The fact that you've based for the past couple of weeks creates an even stronger possible upside move. And up and out from here is still my base expectation. I think we ramp into some sort of exhaustion pattern. I don't know when, um, but maybe it'll correlate with that CPI. That would be picture perfect. Now, if we come over and look at the currency markets, Kiwi stronger up 1%, CAD up as we talked about on some of their news, Japanese yen sharply lower. Everything else middling, but Japanese yen sharply lower. And really, it's a tough one to trade. Um, they're in the process. They've been switching governors and so forth of the Bank of Japan. There's a little bit of unknowns there within that currency. If we look at crypto, crypto markets... Um, I want to say, I've got this wrong, I want to say that Litecoin was up sharply, so maybe I've got this one wrong, because so I wanted to say that Bitcoin was down a little, but the other three were all up, and I'm pretty sure Litecoin was really strong, so somehow I didn't get that one updated. I believe it's up quite sharply this week. And we'll look at that here in a second. I think I'm off on that particular uh, 
cryptocurrency. So let's go look at a few things here. As always, if you have any requests, anything that you'd like to look at specifically, feel free to fire away. I'm going to start with Litecoin. And yeah, it is, as I said, for the week, it's up like 10, okay, 11%. So I knew Litecoin was quite a bit stronger and crypto in general is bouncing a little. Now, Bitcoin is certainly lagging. You can't even really see the rally in, in within Bitcoin, but Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, they're all in bear markets. Litecoin, it's moving to the beat of its own drum and a big spike higher happening there. If we look at the total crypto, if we package them all together, they've rebounded. We talked about the exhaustion highs up here. It was such a good signal. I, I felt strongly that they had basically reached an exhaustion high. The chart that showed it the best was actually its, um, let me think if I can, GBTC, which is the Bitcoin ETF. You had been ramping, 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 and then you had this shooting star on volume after a light volume rally here. Really signaled the exhaustion, and we've come off since then. Where do we go from here? This is still, if we look at crypto overall, it still is in a bearish price pattern of lower lows to lower lows, right? We're rallying. We very well might be making lower highs compared to prior highs. This is still in a bear rally price pattern. If we fail here, it sets a lower high than the one before, which is exactly what bearish markets do. Now, if it can do this, then, then we move into a sideways market. If it does this, we're still in a bear market, making lower lows, lower highs, and so forth. But right now, you can't be outright crazy bullish about crypto. It's just still in this lower swing highs, lower swing lows pattern. And until that changes, I think you got to be skeptical of this rally. Now, if we look at gold and silver and some of those that are comparative, gold really outperformed crypto during this phase but these I mean it ultimately did kind of get exhausted and has been going into this sideways pattern if I were going to look at trading one of those and I lumped them together because they're the anti bank the anti whatever um, gold looks a lot better than crypto we're basically in a high base perhaps at the low end of the range right around the 50 period moving average. You could see this move back to the top end of the range and possibly even break out to the upside. If I've got to put new money to work, I much prefer gold to crypto right here, right now. Um, again, I'm a little bit cautious about both of them because I still think there's more upside in equities. And if you're more into equities and the equity market takes off, Gold and crypto and those markets should lag and should underperform during that period of time. Let's go through our currency baskets and just without even worrying about which currency is at first, just look at the chart and that's helpful to kind of take your opinion away, right? It's not what we think should be happening. Let's look with our eyes and just see what type of price patterns we're in. If I look at this chart of US dollar, well, it's bounced a little bit like we talked about, but still in this lower range. So has US dollar outperformed a little bit of what I expected recently? Yeah, I would say that. Um, is it an outright bullish price pattern? No, it's kind of a basing pattern, more back and forth right here, right now. Uh, if we look at another, again, don't worry so much about what the currency is. It's just looking at the charts. Here we had a symmetrical triangle. See, they call these volatility compressions because the swing lows go up, but the swing highs come down, and so you get compressed within this. Who's in control? Well, nobody for this little period of time, right? The buyers bought the dip, the sellers sold the rally, and it just gets compressed, and now we have a resolution, and the resolution is most certainly 
to the downside. So Japanese yen, it was already in a downtrend. Resumption of that downward trend is still in, in place. The euro, which had been so good for a period of time, really had an exhaustion here right around the time as crypto and gold and some of those other assets. So in an odd twist, the euro happened to have a little bit more of a defensive quality than the U.S. Um, overall, we've had a correction, but still looks longer term sort of healthy, right? Yeah, we've corrected back down, but you've been in this big bull market to have some sort of correction, A, B, C type of patterns and so on. That's normal. And then oftentimes the, the resumption occurs. So euro, okay long term, certainly in the short term has been correcting down. Swiss franc, similar. It's been very strong. Got a little ahead of itself. You can see the parabolic nature of it where it got a little vertical, a little over, overextended perhaps, and now we're in that little correction phase. Not just as this correction here was not something that you have to run to the exits and get out before it collapses and so on. These are pretty commonplace. You run up for a while. It's if you follow Elliott waves, if you go up for five waves, you correct back for three. You go up for five more waves, you correct back for three, you know, and that's sort of the dynamic. These corrections are pretty normal, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, and then perhaps that resumption can occur. So in the short term, they look a little more challenged that way. I said last week, and I stand by this, the bottom half is where I'm looking to buy, which is I'd be more interested in buying British pounds. So if you look at the British pound, sterling, old resistance, new support, starting to bounce here. If we look at CAD, I'd be a little more interested in buying. Um, again, it was an ugly price pattern there. There wasn't a whole lot there, but we talked about this little dip, this little pullback here after the spike up, right? And now we're coming back up towards the top end of the range. Uh, Aussie, downward trend. Kiwi looks the best, and we'll talk about that. But if you are trading Aussie, you really have to get out of this. We talked about symmetrical triangles, volatility compression type of charts, right? That's what's happening here. You're compressing within that triangular pattern. You could break this way. You could break that way. Just as Japanese yen took off to the downside, my thought would be that Aussie probably takes off to the upside. And Kiwi, we can extend this trend line break a little further because it had the picture-esque breakout of the trend line and then the retest. And if you look at, you've probably heard of the price chart pattern that's called head and shoulders tops or head and shoulders bottoms. What a head and shoulders usually is, is it's a trend line break and retest. Okay, if I draw that price pattern, what you see is a head and shoulders, right? You see the this smiley guy and his shoulder here and his head here and his shoulder here. But really what you what you can potentially see is that this is a trend line that when broken, and I didn't draw it perfect, becomes tested on the other side. Or if we draw a head and shoulders bottoming point, well, you're trending lower, you're trending lower, you're trending lower, and then you have kind of a break and a retest. And what you see is this guy standing on his head upside down or whatever, the shoulder, the head, the shoulder. But again, what's really oftentimes in place is this trend line was broken and then retested, right? It's holding us back, it's holding us back, and then we break through and now we retest it. It's a head and shoulders, so see it? See the trend line break and the shoulder, the head, the shoulder, head and shoulders bottoming pattern, etc. So uh, that's a little technical analysis 101 or 
uh, probably a little more advanced than that. We'll call it uh, technical analysis 500 or something. But that's sort of the dynamic in play. And I still like buying these. I think that's you want to be more risk on in this environment until we get the big exhaustion high. Now, I'm going to come on. I don't again, I don't know how soon it will happen. But within the next few weeks, the way I envision it is that we'll talk about, hey, we're getting that big ramp. We're getting this big risk on rally. We're do all these things. These we can check the boxes, um, but there will come a time where we come on here and say, that was it. Did you see it? Did you spot the exhaustion? Did you see the big volume and the, the nature of it? And if you look at what the characteristics would be, it would be a big parabolic move where you kind of get overextended and you're away from the moving averages. Probably some huge bullish candles up here. Maybe even a gap higher. Volume would surge. So see how the volume surged down here at the exhaustion low. Volume would surge right up there at the peaks of this and so forth. So we'll be looking for that dynamic. And it's going to happen, I think. And so it'll be fun to see if you spot it right along with us. Here's CAD uh, Yen which was requested. CAD Yen, um, looking at this, we have some levels identified. And you can really drag these levels over as they're still in place, right? We stalled at resistance. And now we have broken out and look like we're headed towards the next resistance zone. So CAD Yen looking pretty solid. Look at it on the 12 hour, the four hour, this, you know, chart is just, it's solid. It's taking off to the upside. Um, certainly an area that we would want to look at for trades would be long. I'm going to lump them this way. CAD, Kiwi, Aussie, if it breaks out of that symmetrical triangle to the upside is a really interesting idea to start buying dips and start doing some some upside trades in Aussie if and when that happens and British pound these are my more bullish candidates on the bearish side one would think although the USD has bounced but I would put it more on this side of things that I would suspect will be a little bit weaker in the shorter term. So uh, something like CAD Yen still seems like hunting in the right spot. Now Kiwi has been the strongest. That can be both good and bad. At a certain point, it can kind of be too so good that you no longer want to buy, right? It looks like it's entering a big exhaustion phase. That's more of when you want to be taking profits off the table and saying, okay, it's due for a correction. It's due for some mean reversion. And, and once it does that, then I'll go pick up the pieces and, and trade it again. But um, I don't know that, that Kiwi is there yet. And in FX, you can get very, very extended. So I kind of hesitate to be too cautious, even when something's really strong or really weak. And I've taught this concept before that with currencies, you can stay overbought for a very, very, very long time. You know, you look at this daily chart and I don't know that it has a ton more in it in the short term, but why can it just keep going? Well, because you're trading two things, right? You're trading the Kiwi and you're trading the Japanese Yen simultaneously. You're buying this and you're shorting this. Well, that chart can go in a straight line up because while this is going up, this could be going sideways, and that means the chart's working. And then when this goes sideways, this could be going down, and so you're still making money. And then they both start to work together. That goes up, and this goes down, and now it really accelerates to the upside. And that's what's been happening in here. Not now you've got the best of both worlds. But notice, this took a rest. 
this took a rest and the chart never gave ground, right? So if you look at this from the standpoint of resting and mean reversion, the Kiwi took a breather, but the chart kept working. The Japanese yen took a rest, but the chart kept working, right? You can go right back to this and the yen's taking a breather and the chart and you're still making money. And then this one takes a breather and this starts to go back down and you're still making money, you know? So while one is resting, the other can be pulling along. Obviously, the biggest price moves are when both are happening perfectly at the same time. So the best scenario is for the currency you bought to be the strongest and the currency you shorted to be the weakest. But even while that's not happening and one of them's more sideways, the other one can be picking up the slack and continue that chart higher. So I always hesitate to, to ever think that anything is too over anything in FX. It, it, does this have to be overbought because it's up a lot? Heck no. Because maybe the Kiwi will take a breather and the Yen will keep going down and this will go up a little more. And then the Yen will take a breather and the Kiwi will go up and this will go up a little more. And then they'll both work together and that will go up and this will go down and then it will scream higher and so forth. And if you called it overbought, well, you're missing out. So a little hesitation for ever thinking that something is too good or too bad. Now, if it gives you that strong, strong signal that that's the case, if we saw massive exhaustion signals and so forth, then I'd probably take money off the table. But obviously, uh, anything short the yen has been working, especially long CAD, long Kiwi. Um, those are some of the best trades right now that have been taking place in the market. So that's really where I continue to like. I've, uh, that's what I've liked for the past little while as we've talked about this market that should start to accelerate. And I have to say that over the past week, equities haven't gone up all that much. They've really gone sideways, but it's still in that bullish price pattern, still playing out overall. Um, good question. So oil, you can look at oil in a couple of different ways. You can pull up crude oil and just see what oil prices are doing. And there's two types of oil. There's Brent crude and there's light sweet crude. Brent crude is a more uh, dirty oil and needs more refining and so forth. Light sweet crude is a cleaner oil. And so they, they trade somewhat alike but not at exact prices and so forth. If we look at oil, right, on the hourly chart, we've taken off to the upside. Now that's the hourly. If we come into the daily chart, you'll see that it's been a rough picture. Um, recently, we've started to see the higher lows there that have been in place. So we're at least in an upside correction in oil. Maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just a ABC, easy as one, two, three, and then we plunge back down. That's possible, certainly possible. Or maybe we've hit a bottom. And so the chart overall is not really a screaming buy or an obvious short right here, right now. I'd like to just hold off and see a little bit more. If this can get up here above the moving averages and stabilize and so forth, perhaps. Let me talk about what's good and what's bad for oil. This is my fundamental, as Rob calls it, cocktail talk. I think there are some things that are really good for oil, and I think there's some things that are really bad. That The negative side could be the economy. We're seeing some data that the economy is slowing, that the consumer could slow, you know, retail sales missing and so on. Oil is cyclical. So as the economy is stronger, oil tends to do better. As the economy weakens, oil tends to do worse. If you think about oil needs to be consumed and used and what drives that demand for oil, well, 
flights, right? Go jump on an airplane. That requires oil, essentially, to get you from place to place. What else requires oil? Well, all travel, all things like that, and also economic uh, happenings within the global market. So if industrials are out there building and, and doing a lot of work and um, you know, putting in new bridges and roads and all these sorts of things, they're consuming a lot of oil and all of that economic activity would be more bullish. Now, that could be a negative if you think that the, the economy is going to continue to slow here in the not too distant future. On the good news side for oil, if you look at oil producers, companies that produce this, the amount of companies has just gone down by sheer uh, want to get out of the oil business, bankruptcies and things like that. 2020 cleared the decks to a certain extent. And it's interesting because in about 2010, people couldn't, uh, every business that was starting new, like the most popular sector was the energy sector because we had just seen oil spike up to 147 a barrel. And what do people do? They chase the latest craze, right? So oil had skyrocketed in the prior decade and everyone said oil's going to go up forever and this is the place to be. And so there were all these new energy companies, right? Thousands and thousands of them. And they said, we're going to get into the energy business. It's so good there. And they chased, they didn't do what Wayne Gretzky said, which is they skated to where the puck was, not to where the puck was going, right? So they skated to it. And what did what happened to all these energy companies? Well, they went bankrupt for the most part, right? They couldn't make it through 2020 COVID crash. Who survived? All of the biggest, most well capitalized, Exxon, Chevron, and who bought up all these assets as, as Chesapeake Energy and all these other companies went bankrupt and a lot of small energy. Well, it reduced competition. So you went from boom and everybody wanted to start an energy company to bust. Now, that's an interesting dynamic because now there's less competition and so these energy companies can produce more at, it means there's less supply. It means a lot of different things, right? The solution for high prices is high prices. Because oil prices were so high, it drove more interest in that, which in essence drove prices down because now as there's more energy companies and more supply coming, the prices go lower. Now you have a little bit of the opposite effect. It's not the popular place to be anymore. These energy companies, many of them barely survive, and many didn't survive, and so forth. Now everybody is flooding to what? Well, I'd say in the 2023, it's AI. It's artificial intelligence. It's This is the next uh, people are rushing to that and trying to start new AI businesses and trying to use AI in their market. And so we've we're probably still early in that. There's probably a bubble to be formed and then a bubble to be burst, right? I'm not calling the top today in AI. I would assume that there's going to be a lot more businesses. You're going to see different companies change their names and they're going to be, now they're not going to be known as whatever their name used to be. It'll be, um, such and such AI and they'll add that and they'll try to gain clout and so forth and it's just what happens it's going to happen they're going to try to attract investors and all these sorts of things because they're going to put AI in their name and they're going to try to utilize it and they, this is just how things work it's just the cycles that you go through so uh, energy fundamentally is in a good place because it went through this and wiped out a lot of the weaker players. So bad for the consumer in that there's fewer producers of oil and oil has the potential to keep working its way higher. Also, it should be noted that the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the US, is at the lowest level in decades. 
that means that the U.S. government has to buy a lot of oil if they're going to refill that strategic petroleum reserve, which is a sort of an emergency um, emergency supply of oil that they have. It's at the lowest level. So if they refill that, that's going to drive oil prices higher and such. So that's the cocktail talk. And if you agree with me, there are some... Uh, different factors that could be in play. Fundamentally, I sort of like the outlook for energy, assuming the economy's okay. If the economy takes a big hit, oil probably won't be spared. Um, it'll it'll go down some, maybe not as much as other things, certainly, but it'll still experience some downturn. Uh, you bet. Let's look at Euro USD. We had a request for so Euro USD. It's always a chart. I mean, I look at it fairly often, but, you know, I don't know that there's anything blatantly obvious. You kind of broke down and, and pierced the 50 period MA. But is this the start of a new downtrend or is it sort of like back here where you went through a correction and then you worked your way up out of that? I don't know that I have a real strong opinion. Now, if you just want to trade it, you can come into the charts, and most of these are bearish, right? And on the 12-hour, you're in a downtrend, and on the 4-hour, you're in a downtrend, and on the 1-hour, you're in a downtrend. So if you were inclined to just look at it from a technical standpoint and say, what's the trade if there is a trade right here, right now? To me, it's short. It's, it's a bearish trade in Euro USD. Here being an example, old support could act as new resistance. We've been trending lower, downward sloping moving averages and so forth. The technicals are set up more bearish in the shorter term. So that's the best I can give you in terms of Euro USD. I don't have a, a strong opinion, I would say, on that. Currency recap coming out tomorrow. We've got the trading room this weekend, and there just really isn't much on tap for the rest of this week. We've got Fed Chair Powell speaking on Friday. Let me just pull up the calendar. Let's glance at it. So we have Fed Chair Powell speaking on Friday, but that's just going to be a couple of hours of him talking. There's not really any timing of here's where you want to be aware of it, but can it move U.S. dollars and move the market? Certainly. Um Continued discussions out of the debt ceiling. That's going to be a an overwhelming factor. I said, and I stand by this, there is going to be some resolution. They're not going to default. They're not going to have a traditional, hey, you're screwed if you own U.S. debt. We're not paying you back. A massive default. It's just not going to happen. Is there a little possibility that they have to move some money and that it gets people get nervous as the debt ceiling deadline arrives and so forth. I mean, all of that's in play. But the U.S. is not going to have some massive default where people lose out on, on all of these treasuries. I mean, understand, that's money market funds. That's basically, quote unquote, zero risk. And it would create a domino effect that would be catastrophic. So they're just simply not going to allow it to happen, um, meaning that they can do certain things to avoid it, um, where they can bridge the gap. It's possible that you could have a, well, we did, we're not, we're going to roll this debt. We're going to pay you back, but it might be slightly delayed or, or different things. I don't know how that would all go. But I just know that it's not going to be that you lose all this money that you put into U.S. government debt. It's just not going to happen. In fact, Warren Buffett spoke about this in the annual meeting. And he talked about how they, they constantly put money into treasuries um, as just an income producer. And right now, they're paying some yield. And he talked about that he moved $3 billion dollars into short-term treasuries because the market's freaking out about the debt ceiling and worried, and he's not worried, right? And he said, I'm getting even more. I think it was like 5.6%, which was sort of an outlier number. It was so high on the income side. And he, again, knows that that's money good. 
whether there's some nervousness as we get towards it, perhaps, but people are not going to lose their money in U.S. debt. Of that, I am very, very confident. So hope you enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your week. We will be back next week, same time, same place. Goodbye, everyone.